We read together in the scriptures this morning, continuing with our studies in Acts from the last paragraph of chapter 22 and into the first part of chapter 23. So we read from Acts chapter 22 at verse 25. But when they had tied him up with the thongs, remember they're about to scourge him, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, But I was born a citizen. So those who were about to examine him that is, to torture him, withdrew from him instantly. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. But on the morrow, desiring to know the real reason why the Jews accused him, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet And he brought Paul down and set him before them. And Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God shall strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet, contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. Because it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. With respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended, we find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn in pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified about me at Jerusalem, so you must bear witness also at Rome. Amen. And thanks be to God for his word.
You remember that we left Paul having been taken back into custody. He was taken back into custody because he failed to make his case before the crowds and because they were prepared to tear him limb from limb. And what has happened is that the uh, the person in charge has chosen to torture him in order to get at the truth. Now that torture was by scourge, by the Roman flagellum, probably the very same instrument which was used on Jesus, a leather whip, and in its thongs there would be bones and pieces of brass. Very often people did not survive the scourging. Paul then escapes this by revealing that he is a Roman citizen. And because of that, he's brought before the high priest Ananias and the council. The council, of course, is the council of 70, the Sanhedrin. And once again, you see the similarities between what happened to Paul in Jerusalem and what had happened to the Lord Jesus in Jerusalem continue to rise before us. So then the story this morning opens with Paul at last playing his trump card. That is, since he is a Roman citizen, it is against the law to restrain them, far less beat them without a proper trial. They could do what they liked to the barbarians. Lex Julius, that law allowed them to do what they liked to non-Romans, but a Roman citizen had rights, and these rights were fundamental to the law. Paul at last plays his trump card. This is something he has done before. Not just use his citizenship but use it after a delay that needs to be explained. Can I remind you of Acts chapter 16, where Paul in Macedonia is imprisoned. If you're looking back, you look at verse 37. In the morning, the magistrates release them or try to, but Paul says, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men, who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison and do they now cast us out secretly? No, he says. Let them come themselves and take us out. And the police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens and so they came and they apologized to them and they took them out and asked them to leave the city and probably thought they were doing very well to get off so lightly having broken the law of imperial Rome. But why does Paul do this? Why on these two occasions does he hold back his best card? Well, I think there's something important here for us to learn. Paul does not claim any special privileges, neither does he reveal If you don't mind me using the same analogy, neither does he reveal his hand, tip his hand to his opponents until he has to. And I believe that above all what he waits for is the God-given opportunity and the God-given prompting to use whatever is to hand. There's a very deliberate delay in this. And perhaps there's a lesson for us to wait upon the opportunity and to wait upon the guidance of God. You know, very often as Christians we are rash and we want everything at once. Ministers preaching the gospel expect and demand a response right now. And of course that's right because this is the day of opportunity. And today, says the word, harden not your hearts as they did in the Arava. Today might be the day when it becomes too late. Yes, there can be urgency. But there also has to be a wisdom that does not push people when the Holy Spirit is not prompting them. 
If anyone comes to a saving knowledge of the truth, if anyone comes to Jesus Christ to receive him by faith as Savior, they come because the Holy Spirit brings them. And Jesus said of the Holy Spirit that he is like the wind, blowing where he will. And maybe we have something to learn in our personal witness and our expectations of others. While the great surprise is always that people can resist the gospel and not become Christians, perhaps also we should learn to be patient and to pray and to wait for the Spirit as well as present the message with urgency. Now back to the story, and we find that the tribune's first reaction is one of doubt. What he's saying to Paul when he's summoned by the centurion is, are you a Roman citizen? You don't look like one, is the implication. He says, it cost me a lot to become a Roman citizen. And it must be getting a lot cheaper if somebody like you can afford it. Now the point about that is that no one could buy citizenship. They'd either to be born a Roman citizen or had to be given it, granted it as a gift. Ah, yes. But Rome was corrupt. The whole system was rotten. And so you could bribe your way into citizenship. And there was all sorts of things to be gained. No doubt this man's promotion was gained because he was a free Roman. And he'd bribed his way into that. And he's saying to Paul, how could you afford these bribes? And Paul says, I needed none of them because I was born a Roman. He has more status than the tribune. Now the poor tribune sees that he has already broken a serious law and was about to do even worse by using the flagellum on Paul. And the result is that he instantly withdraws his threats. But now he's caught in a very difficult situation because he can't release Paul. They'll tear him apart. He knows Paul's causing trouble somehow. He doesn't know why, but he cannot do anything with the man. And so in this increasing difficulty, the tribune does his best and decides to bring the Sanhedrin, the Council of Seventy, together the next day to help him clear the whole mess up and to find a way forward. But when he does that, it goes wrong too. And it goes wrong because of Paul. Paul, instead of waiting for the accusations to be made, gazes, stares intently around him, says the text. Stares without any fear around this council of seventy, and then grasps his opportunity to speak before they can even start. Now, the accusations never actually get made. We know what they are. 21, chapter 21, verse 28. This is the man who is teaching men everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he has brought Greeks into the temple. We know what they are because we will read of them in chapter 24. They are there in a different form. Verse 5. We have found this man a pestilent fellow, an agitator amongst the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. But on this occasion, the accusations are not even made because Paul grasps the initiative and he infuriates Ananias the high priest who has Paul instantly struck in the mouth. Oh, this is exactly how the Lord Jesus was treated. And Jesus also told us that we who are his servants must not expect different treat treatment from the master. But one of the problems people find with this passage in the book of Acts is the difference between the way Jesus behaved and the way apparently Paul does. In John's Gospel, the high priest questioned Jesus, it says, 
Jesus said, I've spoken openly to the world and I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he said this, one of the officials standing by struck Jesus. Is that how you answer the high priest, he said? And Jesus took it and said nothing. But Paul apparently reacts. How dare you, he says, you whitewashed wall. Now people say, Jesus said turn the other cheek, and here's Paul failing to do so. They say, Paul claimed when he wrote to the Corinthians that when he was reviled, he blessed, and when he was persecuted, he endured. So he did. And this is not him disobeying the command of Jesus, and this is not him failing to live up to his own advice to others. Far from it. Well, what is it then? Well, can I put it to you that you need to understand who Paul is dealing with here to understand what Paul is saying and doing. You see, this Ananias the high priest is not Annas the high priest of John's Gospel or of Acts chapter 4. Don't ever confuse the two. It's a different man now. And Ananias was a man who reigned as high priest from 47 to 58 BC. He was then dismissed and died. He was sacked and died after a further eight years. This man himself was tried for leading riots in Judea by the Romans, but it was never proved. When he was tried, he was reinstated by no less than the emperor Claudius through the influence of the young Herod. Remember, Herod Agrippa was brought up by the Roman Caesars. This is a man, according to Jewish historians, who took bribes and stole the tithes, the stipend of the priest. This is a man whose greed became a byword, so that we are told that in his own day there was a parody of Psalm 24 sung about him. A man who was assassinated by Jewish nationalists in AD 66, hiding in an aqueduct with his brother, Hezekiah. In other words, this man was a total disgrace, a wicked and an evil high priest. And when we know this, we can understand Paul's actions and Paul's words. Paul is not losing his temper, but he's expressing righteous indignation that this man should strike an up apostle of Christ. And as for calling him a whitewashed wall, that comes from the book of Ezekiel. Remember, when the people build a wall, these false prophets, these prophets, says Ezekiel, dub it with whitewash, seeming to believe that the paint will hold the house together, is what Ezekiel says. Pretending it will stand because it's got a coat of paint because it looks good on the outside. And remember in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus saying to the scribes and the Pharisees, you are hypocrites because you are like whitewashed tombs, all fine on the outside, all corruption on the inside, he says. In other words, Paul is pointing out the hypocrisy of the priesthood in the person of Ananias. Beware of whitewash, he is saying. And all through the history of the church of Jesus, we have had to beware of whitewash. To beware of the hypocrisy of saying one thing and doing another. Of presenting an image to the world that is not the reality of what's inside the church. We are warned over and over again about these things. And we are warned individually about making claims as Christians that are not borne out by what we are in our hearts and minds and then in our lives. And so when Paul says, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, in effect, there's an ironic note in that. I'm sure there was. Calvin was sure. And many before him. And what he's saying is this. I didn't think such a man could ever be the high priest. 
Oh yes, he says, I'll acknowledge the office. He quotes from Exodus. You shall not speak evil against a ruler of your people. But he has no respect for the man. And I'm sure that at that point it became very clear to Paul that there would be no justice for him in this court. And having stared around them, he knows that they are split as usual, split between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he uses that split to bring the whole proceedings to a close. Oh, I don't think Paul is claiming to be a Pharisee in order to claim safe ground. He is doing it, I think, just to split this whole thing apart. But do you notice what splits the Sadducees and the Pharisees? The resurrection. You know, Jesus said of the Sadducees that they were wrong, not because they didn't think clearly, not because they weren't good theologians. They were wrong because they neither knew God nor the power of God. And I put it to you that the church of Jesus through the centuries has also had its worst moments, its worst divisions over the resurrection and the reality of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. If you look behind the great divides through the centuries, you will find that the essence of them all is the difference between knowing that Christ is the living Savior and not believing that. And you don't need to read very far and you don't need to look very far to see that the church in our own land and in our own day is split over the same thing. Just a year or two ago, I wrote half of an article my friend George Newlands wrote the other half, and it was side-by-side -side writing because George and I disagree fundamentally about the reality of the virgin conception and therefore the reality of the risen Christ. It still splits us. But the result of this is a riot. The Sadducees who believe nothing are furious, and the Pharisees who hate the Sadducees use the presence of Paul in order to get at their enemies. Now, it's no more than that. And don't think for a moment that this is the Pharisees supporting Paul, because they are not. You'll notice that Luke is very careful to say that it wasn't the Pharisees who supported Paul, but only some of them. Some of the Sanhedrin sympathized with Jesus. You know that. You know about the members of, the, Sad, of the, the, the Sanhedrin who actually went to take Jesus' body because they believed in him. That's one thing. But this is quite another. Paul did not look for support from these men and he did not get it. They were not supporting Paul. They were attacking their enemies. We must learn, of course, not to look for support for the cause of Christ from those who do not know Christ. And what we find at the close of our reading and the close of our worship this morning is that things are getting not better but worse and worse for this pure tribune and again he fears for Paul's life and has him arrested. And when we next come to this passage, we shall find Paul transferred to Caesarea, there to be heard in trial before the governor, Felix. Oh yes. But then we've missed something out this morning, haven't we? We've missed out that bridging verse that we read at the end the bridging verse between what happened then and what happens next. Verse 11. The following night the Lord stood by him. And this is something I would like you to take away from the service this morning.
Now think of Paul's circumstances. He has come to Jerusalem with the Christians weeping and begging him not to go because there was a prophecy, a repeated prophecy amongst God's people that he would go there only to suffer. And think of the violence of the last two days of his life. Every every crisis has been a violent one for these 48 hours. So that he has every indication that he's about to die, that he'll never leave Jerusalem alive. Think of this man at this point in his life where he must have been convinced that that was the end. That the suffering he'd experienced in his missionary journeys was now going to reach a climax in his destruction in the very city where his Savior was destroyed. But his Savior was slain. And think of the state of mind he must have been in. In 2 Corinthians, he speaks about being afflicted, being crushed, being perplexed, being driven to despair, being persecuted, being struck down. And here is a point in Paul's life when he must have felt all of these things. And what happened next? What happened next was that the Lord stood by him and spoke to him. And it's the presence of the risen Lord Jesus in Paul's life, not just that appearance which recalled the appearance on the road to Damascus, I am sure, but it's the constant presence of the Lord Jesus Christ with Paul that makes all the difference for him. Not only his presence, but the instruction to take courage and the promise that he would go from Jerusalem to bear witness in Rome. And what this says to us is that when things are not only difficult, but impossible, when we feel hopeless or threatened or desperate, when we feel broken or hurt, confused and lost, it is the presence of the risen Lord that makes the difference. We said a minute or two ago that the great difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees was the resurrection and that the great differences through the centuries have been between those who know that the Lord Jesus is a risen Lord, a living Lord, a present Lord. Well, here it is. Here is what made the difference for Paul. The Lord Jesus Christ was really with him. Now, if you come back to this evening's service, and I hope you do, We'll think there, we'll hear there of another man who in his way walked with the Lord. This is a matter of living close to God, of walking with the Lord, of trusting Him who is present with every believer. Now, we can be sure of the risen Lord, we can be sure of His presence. If we turn to Him in faith, He is with us. Is He with us? Let us pray. Risen Lord Jesus Christ, You have promised to be with us even to the end of the world. We are weak We can be foolish, we do stumble. But with your presence we are made strong. We are lifted up again. And we are made wise. So Lord, go with us and continue with us as we put all our trust in you. Amen.